guess I'll be the reader. Today's uh, gospel is according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. In this account of an appearance after his resurrection, Jesus opens the minds of the disciples to understand him as Messiah. He convinces them that he has been raised and sends them on a mission to proclaim the message of repentance and forgiveness. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I know that uh, many of you have made a trip to Washington, D.C. at some point in your life. Uh, a lot of times class trips, maybe eighth graders, I know in this community seem to head there every year. And one of the destinations that most people get to if they go is the wall, uh, the Vietnam Memorial, uh, War Memorial. And there was a first grader named Emma who one time had a spring break and was available, and her grandpa said, let's go to Washington, D.C. And so they did. And the first night, they ended up at the wall. And Emma was perplexed by all the names on the wall and said to her grandpa, why, what are all these names on this wall? Why is it important that these names are on this wall? And once she figured out that these were people who had died in combat, she said, why did they have to die? Well, there happened to be a Vietnam veteran standing a few feet away from Emma and her grandpa looking at the wall. And he overheard their conversation and he invited them to, to come over where he was standing. And he said to Emma, honey, I fought with these men in a war a long time ago. And when I came home from the war, I found people wanted to forget what many of us had done over there. And so they built this wall to remind everybody that there were men and women who gave their lives for their country in a faraway place called Vietnam. And then he pointed to the wall and to one name in particular. And he said, do you see this name, Emma? This man right here gave his life for me. He fell on a hand grenade one day and absorbed the blow so that I could live. And it's hard for me even now, he said to Emma, to get my head and my heart around that event, around the sacrifice of my friend. So I just keep coming up or showing up at this wall and talking about this to whoever comes and looks at the wall with me. 
And those of you in the room today who served in Vietnam or Korea or World War II or perhaps some other conflict can maybe relate to the man at the wall. Perhaps there was somebody who gave their life for you and you're able to be here today. Well, all of us, whether we were in the military or not, have somebody who gave his life for us. And his name, of course, is Jesus. And we've heard his story now for a few Sundays, three in total, about his resurrection from the dead. But every time we get together, we tell his story so we remember it, so we don't forget it. And we hear eyewitness accounts about it from his disciples in the, some little stories we call the Gospels. And we hear other writings such as letters of Paul that try to help us understand this amazing story of Good Friday and Easter. We kind of tell these stories. Sometimes we have people come up here like during the Lenten season or other times and they tell you what they feel about this Jesus and what a difference he's made in their lives. Well, today we've got the story for the third time, this time from Luke, uh, Luke's telling. And it's sort of a second half of, a, of another story. Uh, the first half is called The Road to Emmaus. Uh, and briefly, here's that story. It's Easter afternoon, and two, two friends or followers of Jesus are walking out of Jerusalem to a to a, a little town a few miles away called Emmaus. And they're trying to make sense of what just happened over Friday through Sunday. They know what happened on Friday. They saw it with their own eyes. But there's this rumor flying around town on Sunday about an empty tomb. And they don't know what to make of that. And as they walk along, a, a stranger comes up alongside them. They don't know who it is and walks with them toward Emmaus. And as they walk, this stranger unpacks the scriptures for them and helps them understand that what happened on Friday and Sunday was foretold in their scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And as they come to Emmaus and come to a house, they invite him to come in for a meal with them. And as he sits down with them, he takes some bread and breaks it and gives it to them. And in the act of doing that, they recognize who it is. It is Jesus of Nazareth. And then like that, he disappears. That's the backstory, okay, to today's story that starts out with these words, while they were talking about this. That's the they and the this, okay? They have just rushed into this place with this amazing story about what happened. And now Jesus does it again and suddenly appears to them and says these words that you said earlier today, peace be with you. And I'm going to suggest today that he comes to you as he came to them long ago with four gifts that all start with P. They're on the screen there. Peace and his presence, and a new purpose for life, and then power to live out that purpose. So first, let's look at peace. Peace be with you. Now think about it for a little bit. Think about the people that he said that to. Remember what they had done on the prior uh, Thursday night into Friday. Remember that story? In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the soldiers come, uh, Judas leading the, the, the group, uh, and once this starts to get out of control, all those disciples run for their lives to save their skins. And then fast forward a few hours, Peter standing in a courtyard, and a, a, a young woman says, aren't you one of his friends? You sound like a Galilean. And three times he denies knowing this Jesus. Now these are the guys that he says, peace be with you to them. Kind of reminds me of the old saying, with friends like them, who needs enemies? They haven't been very faithful, but yet he gives them his 
peace and their relationship is restored. And you hear this same word uh, in a letter that Paul writes to the Romans, making the case that we have peace too through Jesus' death and resurrection. We can have the next slide, uh, Jim. Uh, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, Paul writes, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Paul spends four chapters kind of building an argument like a lawyer does, saying that, you know, you just can't be made right with God by keeping the Ten Commandments or whatever law you want to pull out because you have something within yourself called sin that creates a barrier between you and God. But Jesus came to tear the barrier down, and now we can trust Jesus to give us eternal life. And as a result, Paul says, we have peace with God. We have peace. The next thing he gives you is, and those disciples, is his physical presence. Now the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost. Did you pick that up in the reading? Anybody here remember Casper, the friendly ghost? You older people? Okay, you younger ones, you're too young to have. (laughs) That never got... um, The reruns don't make it anymore of Casper, I don't think. But we watched Casper the Friendly Ghost and kind of enjoyed that. I suppose in modern day, we we all remember the movie Ghostbusters, right? And those ghosts weren't like Casper. They were kind of mean and troublesome. Uh, But they apparently thought of ghosts back then too, 2,000 years ago. And Jesus says, hey, I'm no ghost. And to prove it, he shows them his hands and feet and even eats a piece of fish to boot, to try to prove that he has a physical body. The the marks of the nails are still in his hands, as you see on our background today. This is interesting because in that day, the ancient Greeks believed not in the resurrection of the body, but in what's called the immortality of the soul. They thought the body was bad, that the body was kind of like a prison for your good soul. And when you died, then that soul was finally released from that prison and it could go flying all over the universe and go wherever it wanted to go. The, the, The soul was good, the body was bad in their minds. Jesus comes back with a new resurrected body to say, no, the body is good. Your bodies are good because they were created by God. And so we say in a creed that we'll confess in a few moments, we believe not in the immortality of the soul, right? But in the resurrection of the body. And that's where this comes from, this this little phrase from this story that we have here. He gives us peace and presence and then a new purpose for life. Remember these disciples, some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, others we don't really know what they did before Jesus got a hold of them. But now he says, okay boys, I've got a job for you to do. You are to be proclaimers. Announce, preach, tell, teach the good news about Jesus, about me. Call people to repentance, tell them that their sins are forgiven. Tell it all over the world. Start here, but go out from here. And we know that that's what happened. Read the book of Acts. That tells the story, how they started in Jerusalem and went out kind of like ripples in a pond. You know when you throw a rock in a, in a river or a pond and how you get those concentric circles. And you start with the center circle of Jerusalem and then finally the outer rings are the ends of the earth. You are witnesses, he says. At our middle service, these chairs were filled with our high school kids. And some of them are going to go to Malawi uh, in about two months to work at Camp Chisomo. Um, Most of these kids, when they were in eighth grade, knelt at this rail at the end of their uh, spring year. And we prayed a prayer over them, like we do for all confirmants, and said... 
pour out your Holy Spirit upon these, these children and help them to live a faithful life. Now, five, six, seven years later, these eighth graders are now in college or in their senior year of high school. And look what the Holy Spirit has done in the meantime with these, these young people. Now they've got a fire in their belly to go to Africa and teach children about Jesus, to be witnesses, just like Jesus called those first disciples to do in our story. But in order to go to Africa or for us to have the courage to go to work or our neighbor or our family even and share this word about Jesus, it takes some power coming into us from the outside, the last P. And Jesus says to them that day, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here. Stay in this place called Jerusalem for a while until you receive that power from on high. And we know that that happened on what we call Pentecost, 50 days after they heard these words, the power came down in fire and wind, and we'll celebrate that five weeks from today on May 20th. And incidentally, that's Confirmation Day, a perfect day to think about the power of the Spirit as we'll have eighth graders at this rail again. We'll pray over them for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, and who knows what those eighth graders are going to end up doing in their life. Maybe they'll become Iwalu counselors, or maybe they'll go to Africa, or maybe get involved in their campus ministry life wherever they end up. Whatever they do, when the master's hand comes upon them, their life changes. And the same is true for you. Let me try to illustrate that with a story. One of the most famous musicians of the 1800s, the late 1800s, was the guy you see on the screen, a Norwegian violinist, self-taught, named Ole Bull. He traveled around America and Europe giving concerts. He was at Decora in the late 1800s, in uh, Minneapolis, in Wisconsin, along with many other places. Our ancestors knew who Ole Bull was. He was a rock star for Norwegians uh, back in those days. He was known by everybody who was a Norwegian, but in Europe, because they didn't have media like we do today, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have the internet, you know, it took a while for these people to get known. And one day he was walking through a forest in northern Europe, and it was getting dark, and he decided, he was kind of lost, I'd better find some shelter. And he saw in the distance uh, a, a little log cabin with some smoke coming out of the chimney. And he went up to the door and knocked, and an old man came to the door and welcomed him in. He was a hermit, lived by himself. He made Ole some soup that he had, uh, had earlier that, that evening, uh, gave him some coffee, and they sat down in front of their fireplace, or of his fireplace, to warm up. And he reached over, the old hermit did, and pulled something out from under, under a table, and it was a battered violin case. And he said to Ole, it took me years to learn how to play this, but I'll play you a little tune. And he tried his best with that old battered violin, and out came this kind of screechy, hard to listen to song, a folk song. And Ole said to the man then, well, do you think I could play a song on your violin? And the hermit replied, well, I don't know about that. It took me years to learn what I just played. Who are you walking in to my cabin? But Ole said, well, just let me try. And he took that old violin and he drew the bow across the strings and suddenly this cabin was filled with the most beautiful music that the old hermit had ever heard in his life. And he began to weep tears of joy. 
Folks, in our life, we may start out in our younger years being fit as a fiddle, but in older years, our life, if it's a violin, gets pretty beat up and battered, doesn't it? Our life strings can snap under the pressure of work or maybe health concerns or other things. Our life's bowl gets kind of bent over time with what life gives us. But when our master comes through the Holy Spirit and takes our life, this battered, beaten violin of life, and starts to play on us, something beautiful can come out of it, something amazing. All it takes is the touch of the master's hand. And our teenagers and our college students often show us how this works as they are so bold in their witnessing to their friends and to anybody who will listen about what Jesus means to them. We know it's just about graduation time, and pretty soon these seniors are going to kind of go, remember how this is? We all kind of go in many different directions, and we don't see those people that we were with every day for 12 or so years. It's going to be soon time for these seniors to go their separate ways. And one senior wants to make sure her friends know about what she thinks about Jesus. Let's take a listen to what she has to say. If somebody can catch the lights, please. I grew up going to church every Sunday, and my mom made sure that all of us were in church as much as possible. I feel like there's an urgency to bring my friends to church and just to... As graduation approaches closer and closer, I feel like these are the last opportunities I have to actually communicate in a day-to-day -day basis with some of these people. I need to um, let them know what I believe in, even if they don't accept right now that they, they'll just know um, about God's love. At my school, I feel like I've just been able to really share with them what's going on in my life and just how God's working in my life. I had a friend um, who's in my grade, and her grandmother died, and I just wrote her a little note and said, well, I've been thinking about you and your family and just been praying for you during this time because she was really torn up about it. And I put a verse at the bottom. I think I put Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. And she was like, thank you so much for the note. And she didn't understand what the 17, 17 meant. And that, she goes to church like every Sunday. And I really thought that, you know, she had at least a basic understanding of the faith. And just to know that she didn't even know what, I guess what a scripture reference is, it just made me think about, you know, what am I assuming about my friends? And what am I assuming that they know when really I should be sharing? Even if I think it's repetitive and even if I think they know it. And I think that's really, that experience in particular has made me think the people I think might be Christians or might even have a basic understanding really don't. And I need to even work harder to um, just share the faith with them. You are witnesses of these things, Jesus said, then and now. And may he bless your witnessing this week as your life is touched by the Master's hand. Would you please stand as we confess our faith using the words of the